Dr. Pat, and today we're going to discuss uh, in this video the enthalpy of mixing for Bragg Williams, uh, basically free energy of mixing. So last time we figured out, uh, basically we did the delta G of mixing. We figured out that we're going to do today delta H of mixing minus T delta S of mix, and we the big conclusion was our entropy of mixing always will drive us uh, to mix. And again, it's this difference in kind of translational uh, entropy. So we have more configurations upon mixing than in our unmixed state. So we are always going to be driven towards or to be mixed by this term here. Unfortunately, um, and typically, we're going to see uh, today that the driving force against mixing, mixing to stay phase separated is going to be this enthalpy of mixing. So this is the enthalpic contribution to free energy. And again, it depends on the interaction between molecules on our lattice. So just like we talked about last time or what we saw, we have uh, this initial state. Uh, where again, on our lattice, we have numbers of red particles, numbers of blue particles, numbers of particle one, number of particle two, and then we are going to mix uh, and go to this state. So when we're thinking about interactions and enthalpy, uh, we are going to make our lives a little bit easier by invoking something called the mean field theory. So when we think about interactions and we're on, when we're on our lattice, you can kind of see here uh, if we're focused on our particle right here, blue. In this blue particle, it can interact with either red particles or have a certain number of interactions. On uh, kind of the square lattice that we've been drawing, at each point or each juncture where our monomer or where our small molecule is going to sit, what are the number of possible interactions it can have? Well, it depends on the number of nearest neighbors, uh, basically this parameter z. So on this lattice, I can only interact with my kind of nearest neighbors. So there's one, two, three, four nearest neighbors, or z number of nearest neighbors. Again, you could have a hexagonal lattice number of different types of lattices that you can kind of deal with. So um, it would be very, very, very difficult um, in order to kind of have to consider every single position of every single molecule, and it's not realistic. So instead, we're going to make our lives a lot easier by invoking this kind of mean, mean field theory. So uh, we are going to, instead of treating this lattice discreetly, we're going to describe it uh, basically in terms of specific interaction with species and the probability of basically interacting. So it is going to... Um, the neighbors of each lattice site is going to take on uh, basically the average properties of the entire lattice. Specifically, it's going to depend on our volume fraction of one and two. So you can kind of see this mean field schematic right here, where instead of discreetly thinking about, okay, molecule uh, here, we have one molecule counting each number of interactions, right? So for this system, we have three one two interactions and one two two interactions. Here we have two one two interactions and two, one, one interactions. Instead, we're going to treat it as a mean field and just say approximately we'll have some probability of uh, basically interacting with uh, these kind of species. So it's all going to depend on the volume, you know, we know the volume fraction of our molecules one or molecules two. So we know that, we know that mole fraction, uh, so we can kind of depend and measure those properties. Uh, so we'll make this mean field approximation moving forward for the rest of this derivation. So let's think and let's start off with calculating uh, the enthalpy of mixing. So we need to figure out what is the enthalpy of our mixed state, H12. So how are we going to calculate the enthalpy of this final state right here? Well, again, let's look and treat and consider and add up <laughs> basically our number of interactions. So probability of finding any species I on a given lattice site is given by the volume fraction. So the enthalpy of, of mixing is just going to be the number of one, two interactions times the energy, so this epsilon is basically the energy, just what we saw for monomer monomer. This is going to be the energy of the 1, 2 interactions, the number of 1, 1 interactions, and the number of 2, 2 interactions. Again, multiply the their respective energies. So uh, let's kind of take this step by step at a time. So how are we going to figure out the number of 1, 2 interactions? So let's think about, and let's kind of basically make, make it more general, look at the interactions between yeah, basically nu, i, and j. So the number of species will be one and two here. So the number of one, two interactions are going to depend on uh, the number of one sites, the number of nearest neighbors, and the probability of the adjacent site being species two. So we know the number of one sites. That is just going to be N1. The number of nearest neighbors, that's going to be Z. If we're dealing with square last, that's four. So the probability of the adjacent site being species two that is going to depend on our volume fraction or mole fraction, too. So the number of two 
are you know kind of capital on one so you could do n2 x2 or excuse me the volume fraction there so that was defined previously in the uh, previous video so n2 divided by n not got ahead of myself there uh, that is just going to be the probability of basically the adjacent side being species 2 so what's the volume fraction of our two particles so uh, that is just going to be our expression. So the number of one, two interactions is going to be this. So that's it. So V12, we'll plug that back up into there. Now we can use the same logic to find the number of one, one interactions. So what is the number of one sites? So if I want to find new one, one, number of one sites, it's going to be N1 again, number of your neighbors, Z, probability of adjacent, B, C, C, uh, probability of adjacent site being species one, which is going to be V1. Can I end it here? No, right? Because I need to avoid any issues of, of overcounting, um, basically doubling counting. So when I look at this molecule, and I'm looking at the probability of the number of 1 1 interactions. If I count this interaction, it's also going to be counted twice here. So I don't want to double count. Um, so if I count, you know, again, the number of interactions for each particle, I don't want to double count this. This is one interaction between these uh, particles. Same thing here. I don't want to double count for this interaction and this interaction. So when you're looking for particles of the same species and you're looking for similar interactions between 1, 1 and 2, 2, the expressions are the same, but all I have to do is divide by 2. That's it. Nothing too crazy there. Because again, probability of adjacent site being, again, since it's 1, 1, it's 2. Here we go. So we've got our V1, 1. We've got our V1, 2, 2. We've got our V1, 2. Now let's plug and chug into our expression here. Or again, the number of interactions is just going to be here, maybe V1, 2. This is going to be V1, 1. This is going to be V2, 2. So let's go back down to here, plugging it in. And this is your enthalpy, total enthalpy in our mixed state. That's it. Too bad, hopefully so far. <laughs> so this is the enthalpy on mixing. But we also need our H1, 1 state, and our H2, 2 state. So let's go back to our schematic. In our H11 state, what is our enthalpy? Well, all it is for H11, it's just going to be number of one interactions times Z on our lattice, and that's it. We don't have to invoke any mean field theory here because we're not looking at the probability. On our, in our unmixed state, the probability, uh, basically the probability of finding a one particle is not given by the volume fraction because the volume fraction in our unmixed state, r phi one is equal to kind of one. Or completely, you know, the probability of finding one, uh, the, the next, in our lattice, the next particle is a one particle. So that probability is one. But again, we have to multiply by our energy as well, and we have to divide by two again to do that overcounting issue. So, and two is gonna be the same, two divided by two. That's it. So we can now calculate the uh, delta H of mixing, the uh, change in enthalpy of mixing. Uh, you can just plug in those values here. So math, uh, you can kind of do these terms. And what you end up with is this expression, this critical expression right here. So the delta H of mixing is this. So this term inside here, uh, actually specifically this term right here, we're going to introduce a new and very, very important parameter uh, right here. So our enthalpy, uh, our delta H of mixing, this kind of, uh, basically, we're going to introduce this chi parameter here. So these, this is a critical kind of term here. So this is describing, uh, basically, the energy, these, basically, the interaction energy, or the enthalpy of these different interactions. So we're going to introduce this new parameter that's going to encapsulate some of this as this chi parameter. So the Flory chi parameter, we're going to use this a lot in this course, so really, really pay attention <laughs> here, if nowhere else. So, Z is just, again, your number of nearest neighbors. KT, uh, again, is our, you know, our energy. So, what you can kind of see here, also, you can see that chi is a dimensionless parameter, but uh, that's a little bit, uh, well, we'll talk about a little bit about that later on. So, chi, though, is a measure of the energy of the interaction between components being mixed. So, let's think about, Z is always going to be basically a positive number. AT must be positive. So 
the sine of chi, whether chi is greater than zero or chi is less than zero or the magnitude of chi, but chi is going to be essentially determined by this interaction energy. So if chi is large and positive, so my chi is large and positive in this case, what am I, what am I saying here? Well, if chi is large and positive, I know that E12 must be much, much greater than this one half E11 plus E22. What does that mean? Yes, mathematically, that's true. But what it's saying is that my energy of interaction, basically the enthalpic interaction between one and two, is extremely, you know, sub one, two, yeah, is very, very, very high. That is not good, again, going back to our uh, fundamental equation. That is not good in terms of energy. I want my energy to be very, very low. So if my energy here is large and positive compared to my unmixed state, 1, 1, and 2, 2, those 1, 1 interactions, those 2, 2 interactions, what I'm, saying, what I'm saying is that energy is much, much higher. It does not want to be in that mixed state. 1 and 2 do not want to interact with each other. So they will prefer to be in the unmixed state enthalpically. So that is going to push, and this is often the case, um, so it will push towards a phase separated state. So whereas delta S mixing always push towards mixing, generally speaking, your delta H of mixing is always going to be positive and it's going to push for phase separation. It wants those particles to be phase separated. They don't want to be uh, next to one another. So this is a more common case. Now you can have the scenario where your chi value is less than zero. In that case, we know that basically E12 is much, much less, or, you know, basically it's negative, or it's less than one half E11, the magnitude at least, of E11 plus E22. Uh, in this case, if our chi is less than zero, we know one and two want to interact with each other, and then they'll be phased, uh, they'll be mixed together, and we'll see when we look at the full free energy. If your chi is uh, less than zero, we're going to mix always, basically at all temperatures, there's never going to be an issue uh, for mixing, but it is not common. Um, you To get negative chi values, you need to have a really, 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 really good solvent. So most of the time, we're going to have this scenario where our E12 is much, much greater, positive, large. They don't want it to interact and mix with each other. And that's going to kind of give us some kind of interesting phase behavior where at certain temperatures, certain concentrations, certain values of chi, because um, you can see here that chi, also importantly, chi is inversely proportional to 1 over T. So that is a kind of a very, very important parameter to kind of think about. That, that inverse relationship uh, might give you some headaches when we're looking at uh, phase diagrams. But if we rewrite our expression now in terms of chi, so our delta H uh, mixing here, we get this expression. This is the one that we're going to use. So you can see here that depending on the magnitude of, you see there's another uh, kind of temperature out here. Depending on the magnitude of uh, temperature and chi, basically this chi parameter is going to vary, it's going to be, that is going to be, uh, and we'll see that, uh, in a bit in our full free energy calculation, that is going to be kind of the critical parameter that tells us um, at large values of chi, we're going to phase separate for certain, uh, uh, basically for certain volume fractions of either one or two. Uh, so we have to kind of consider that chi is going to be our tunable, our, our tuning parameter that tells us are we phase separated or mixed. So next time, Full free energy expression for Bragg Williams, combine everything, and then let's look at some kind of fun, funky graphs uh, and give a hint about what's to come once we switch to all. So, thanks. I'll see you next time. Have a good one.